Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. We have a breaking news that is coming out on Sputnik News there, speaking about U.S. allies primarily responsible for the situation in, in the Syria region. This is according to President Putin there in an interview with French TV uh, TF1 earlier today. And one of the things that he said here was when, when um, he says, I am deeply convinced that the responsibility for the situation in the region as a whole, and Syria in particular, lies on our Western partners, primarily, of course, the United States and its allies, Putin told the TF1 television uh, channel. They also, the question came up about the, uh, the aid convoy and that, you know, the United States is blaming Russia for this happening. President Putin responded like this, we got an offer that our armed forces, the servicemen of the Russian army, stand on this road and ensure security. I said, no, we shall do it, but only with the U.S. side, offer it to them. They refused to straightway. They do not want to stand there. They do not want to pull back military units of these opposition terrorist groups, Putin told the TF1 television channel. One, uh, excuse me, uh, on refugee crisis, accusations that Russia is responsible for the mass outflow of people from Syria because of its military operations, they are completely groundless. And this process commenced long before Russia became active in the country, Russian President Vladimir Putin said. And Sunday, U.S. Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton claimed that many people had had to leave Syria because of alleged Russian aggression. And any accusation that Russia is allegedly to blame in the refugee issue are completely groundless, Putin, to, Putin told the TF1 television channel. Yeah, it's quite, you have to, we have to face the facts of the facts, guys. I mean, the biggest uh, humanitarian crisis began before Russia ever got involved with the Syrian government. We had already, you know, hundreds of thousands upon thousands of refugees that were fleeing the country, going into Turkey. Uh, uh, flooding into uh, into Europe, Germany, uh, before Russia really got actively involved in trying to turn the tide in this. And what was really funny is that the U.S. never uh, the never the U.S. never really engaged directly themselves until Russia came in. Uh, other than backing all of the terrorist groups that are in the country of Syria now, that was about the only time that Russia, or excuse me, the U.S. ever got involved. Uh, to kind of make things a little bit worse here. Uh, this came out on Reuters earlier today. Putin's ally tells Americans, vote Trump or face nuclear war. Of course, he has been known to be pretty much outspoken before. His name is uh, Zer Zeranos Zerov not I can't get it right, Zeranovsky. Uh, we've actually reported things he said before on Israeli News Live, but at any rate, what Zer Zer excuse me, Vladimir Zeranovsky uh, is stated is that uh, if Donald Trump is president next month, uh, then you know things would be a little bit better. If not, it risk being dragged into a nuclear war, according to the Russian ultranational ally, President Vladimir Putin, who likes to compare himself to the U.S. Republican candidate. Um, at any rate, there, you know, he made it, he made his views known very well in there. He says the relations between Russia and the United States can't get any worse. The only way they can get worse is if a war starts, says Zaranovsky. Uh, Speaking in, the, in a huge office on the 10th floor of Russia's State Duma or lower house of parliament, he says Americans voting for president on November 8th must realize that they are voting for peace on the planet Earth if they vote for Trump. But if they vote for Hillary, it's war. It will be a short movie. There will be uh, Hiroshima's and Nagasaki's everywhere. Now, he is known, like I said, he's very known for some uh, straight-out flamboyant rhetoric, uh, to say the very least, but uh, that's, that's pretty serious in what he's stating. Uh, but to kind of add fuel to the fire about that, Russia's Pacific Fleet nuclear sub successfully live fires and sea launched an ICBM. This came out today on October the 12th here as well. The nuclear sub successfully test firing showed high level of the Pacific Fleet Submarines Forces readiness. And that's been a question that was kind of lurking, I noticed in some articles recently, is uh, whether or not the Russian subs would actually be able to successfully launch the ICBMs or would it be, you know, wait and see type scenario? Well, President Putin is not waiting and seeing. He is testing his fleet's uh, readiness. Uh, there's also been other tests of the Top uh, Topol, I believe, as well, was test fired a live ICBM as well inside of Russia to make sure that everything is active and working there. So Russia is definitely getting ready if in the event 
something doesn't work out very well. But you know, another thing aside from that, let me just mention as well, and I don't have it up on the screen, but I know that uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov was stating today, Russia is not looking for a conflict. They do not want a war. And he says they don't, he doesn't actually believe that we are on the brink of war. And that's according to President, or excuse me, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, but if you look at Syria, uh, maybe for Russia, they're not on the brink of war, but when it comes to the United States and the provocation going back and forth, to me, it's definitely, it's on the brink of war. Uh, so it's very concerning to me and what I'm seeing regarding these things. Uh, another news here, I wanted to bring something to your attention. I know there's been some that have actually stated that, uh, you know, when we reported about the, uh, the missiles that were fired from the... Um, from the Russian ships out in the Mediterranean that struck positions that were held by both Israeli, American, Turkish, Saudis, and Qatar uh, forces, that some people believe that that was no, nothing more than just over-exaggeration, that it was, it was uh, Russian propaganda, even though it was uh, reported on Pravda, on uh, the state-run television in Russia, the article came in about there, they reported it. Uh, it was first picked up by the Sputnik News Arabic language from sources on the ground, in which we as well have our own sources inside Syria uh, as well. So we're able to find out information uh, to, co to corroborate information that is going on. But what I thought was inter interesting was Judah Ari Gross, who is an Israeli, who deals with the, uh, uh, the, the Israel's... Uh, uh, as far as the military actions that are going on, also published on September 22nd, 2016, that this strike indeed did happen. Now, he is citing, he's actually citing the Iranian source uh, news for this, uh, but in fact, it was Sputnik that originally brought this article out, and Iranians, of course, picked it up as well. It uh, says that Mossad, other foreign agents killed in Aleppo strike. Now this is an Israeli news source, the Times of Israel, reporting it as well that Mossad agents were killed in this. Now, I know that some have said to me, you know, in comments, they're like, Steve, you know, how could, you know, if it, it, there's no way Israel would, would be there. This, this can't be true. And they said if it would have, were true, then Israel would have flattened Syria within hours for killing this, the Mossad agents. Well, you got to remember, it's not just Mossad. It's also Americans. It was uh, British but here's where the issue comes down to this. No, they wouldn't do that. And the reason being is because Israel cannot let it be known that they're inside Syria working there, neither could the United States, because then this would be an open admission to both the Israeli public as well as the American public that the governments are intentionally and directing terrorist organizations inside of uh, Syria. And when I say terrorist organizations, you have to remember the reason why Russia struck this particular facility that was working in the mountains outside of Aleppo was because they had, they had already picked up the radio transmission that this is where it came from to give the orders to strike the Syrian uh, uh, army there out there in Del El, El Zor. So this is why they struck that position there, to stop the intelligence sources that were feeding ISIS. And they knew from the recordings that it was being, they were uh, working directly with ISIS. That's why the United States, neither Israel, nor Turkey, nor the Saudis, nor the Qatarians, none of them are going to admit that this happened. That's why Western media has never published this, is because if they ever admit to it, then we will know that indeed, there is a direct backing by the Israeli government, the American government, the Obama administration, that they are intentionally backing ISIS, but yet on the other hand, uh, not in the case of the Israelis, but in the case of the Americans, that they are there bombing ISIS, and then we find out that it's nothing but a big lie after all. This is why they don't admit to what actually happened. It would cause a backlash in public opinion, both for the Israeli government as well as the American government, to admit that this actually happened. That's why they don't speak about it. And of course, uh, it says here in the article, he quotes here, according to the Arabic language version of the Russian Sputnik News Agency, some 30 Israelis and Western officers died when they were hit by three caliber cruise missiles fired by Russian warships and uh, foreign officers uh, coordination operations room in western Aleppo near Mount uh, Simeon. Simeon. In addition to the Mossad agents, the Russian report claimed military officers from the United States, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Kingdom, and Turkey. Virtually every country hated by Iran, Syria, and Russia 
were killed in the strike according to the battlefield sources. Now, watch what he says here. The foreign officers were directing the terrorist attacks in Aleppo and it and Idib, the Iranian Fars News reporter, referring to the rebel groups that control the Syrian cities. The Israeli government did not immediately respond to request for comment. You know, silence sometimes is an easier way for admission. And I just thought it was interesting, and I wanted to bring this to your attention as well, that indeed the Times of Israel was actually reporting this attack as well. And I'm sure that there's been some very low-key funerals that have taken place. Of course, there's always funerals that take place in Israel, of course, in the United States as well, that no one would ever even catch on to, especially when you're dealing with CIA or Mossad or anything else. These are things that must be very much low-key. But the fact is, it did happen. And one of the major reasons why we should realize that it happened is why suddenly did the United States, did Britain, call an immediate emergency Security Council meeting and were in major anger over Russia and over Aleppo when it was just right before then that they had attacked the Syrian army and you would have thought that the, that the U.S. and all these other groups here would be apologizing to the Syrians, which they did. You know, Obama said, oh, it was a mistake, we're sorry. The British said, yes, we were involved, we're sorry. But then immediately thereafter, right after we did the report about this happening, that the Russians had actually launched the cruise missiles and it had struck and killed. And it, now, by the way, when it says the 30 Israelis, it's 30 intelligent officers all together. Israelis are only included in there. So we don't know for, ex for sure if it was, you know, 10 Israelis or 12 Israelis or five Israelis, or whatever the case may be, but if they were all combined together working there. And I would imagine probably you would have had more Saudis and Turkish working there because of the Arabic backsiding there. Uh, and also keep in mind too, when it comes to Mossad, uh, we do have many Mossad agents that are Palestinian, and Israel just considers that collateral damage when it comes to the, to the Palestinians that are working for the Mossad. But they use them because they can blend in easier with uh, operations that are going on in Syria. And that's not the first time. We have uh, had other reports as well. We've reported here on Israeli News Live where Mossad agents were actually Palestinians working for the Israeli government. And we've seen before where they just kind of get left behind. Collateral damage. That could be the issue as well. Not really sure on all the things there, but very interesting, uh, especially with everything going on. One thing, too, I wanted to bring to your attention, something my wife found for me that she wanted to share with me. The New York Times had reported an article back in 2012, October 12th, secret uh, Israel-Syrian peace talks involved the Golan Heights exit. Now, the Israeli government did deny that this had actually, uh, that, that Netanyahu had, was, had, was never in agreement of turning over the Golan Heights. But according to the article here, and according to those that were involved in the negotiations for uh, a peace deal with Syria, which we've spoken about before back in 2011 when John Kerry was trying to work out a peace agreement between Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and, and that of the uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, that there were talks going on. But according to the article here by the, by the New York Times there, they stated that, that Netanyahu was actually willing to give up the Golan in order to work out a peace deal. But Netanyahu never trusted fully Assad because he wasn't willing to break the ties with Iran. And that was one of the contingents for giving up the Golan is if Israel uh, could get the securities from uh, President Bashar al-Assad that he would break ties with Iran and that with Hezbollah over in Lebanon. But the deal fell apart. Of course, the Arab Spring caused everything to break up all over the world, which we knew from inside sources was caused by Washington to begin with uh, through something that they were using mind control. The man setting himself on fire. I knew that directly from inside sources in Washington that it was actually done by Washington through mind control when the man burned himself to death. Uh, there in the streets of Egypt, which really began the Arab Spring. It was successful, which is something they said America was trying to do as well when the black man burned himself at the National Mall in Washington, D.C. But they said it didn't work like it worked in the Middle East. Anyway, be sure to tune in tonight on the Noon Institute. You too will be loading up a very interesting message. I'm sure it'll be a blessing for many of you, those that are interested in that. And shalom and good evening. I'm Stephen Benin with Israel News Live.